Okay, thanks. Uh, I brought a few slides along just to help explain this, but I think it's not just a matter of um, what they can do to assist the board. I think that uh, uh, chief executives uh, sort of underestimate the role and even responsibility they have to actually uh, change the culture of the board. So um, uh, one of the things, uh, I, I'm just this is really around a thought experiment really. This slide really shows the generative curve and it's actually borrowed out of product development which has a lot of experience in this. And if you have a look at this slide, you'll see how there's a time for generativity and then it drops dramatically. Um, so if you actually have a look at what happens uh, in most boards in a government situation, the time at which the board gets involved, the typical board involvement um, curve is actually very late uh, in, the governor, uh, sorry, in the generative cycle. So most of the opportunity for generativity is lost. And why this is really important uh, is uh, really uh, revealed in this slide. There's three really important elements for boards. Uh, the first one, which you'll see on your right, is uh, fiduciary. And that's where the role is stewardship and the responsibility is oversight. Then in the center is strategic, where the role is um, as strategist and the responsibility is um, foresight. And then right to the left, uh, the, um, uh, where generativity is, the role is um, sense maker, and the actual uh, responsibility is insight. So if you just have a look at the things that I've spoken about, um, what's really important uh, in leading for health and safety is when you involve your board. And the most important part of this is at the framing thinking stage. But if you actually have a look at what really happens, um, the board is involved so late that all they're left with in reality is inquiry and um, oversight and there's a huge opportunity missed. So I think that um, in my experience and our own research at the New Zealand Leadership Institute at the University of Auckland, uh, we have found that despite what boards think and despite what boards say, they're very hardwired to the fiduciary and uh, boards um, are not very generative. And uh, to think that health and safety is a fiduciary process only is to make a real error. What we need in our boards is a balance between generativity, strategic approach, and also being fiduciary. And I don't think chief executives should underestimate their roles. So one of the things you'll find, just in closing, is if you discuss this with many directors, the first thing they'll say is, this is going to be a lot of extra work. Well, the reality, if you're on a board and you aren't prepared to do extra work to make people safer, then really I think you should be thinking about your own motives for being on boards. Everything involves a lot of extra work. Health and safety, particularly in New Zealand, right where it is at the moment, involves a lot of extra work for directors. And that should be an expectation that you as a chief executive should have. So I think that there's much that can be done now to reframe the whole situation in boards and stop this default to the fiduciary only because that will not, as you heard from Kirsten, that will not allow us to get where we're looking to go. an alignment between what management is expecting from their boards around safety and what the board is expecting from management around safety. So there, if they're at different points on that pathway, it can create quite a difficult environment, um, particularly for you as CEOs, because I know that um, if I think of some of those examples, the CEO and their executive team are doing an incredibly good job at developing processes and policies and procedures or whatever it might be they're working on, yet the board is either compliance focused or they're at the other end. There's just not an alignment. Um, and so that's why I say context is really important and the way that, and I need to educate and I have been talking to other directors, we need to be aware that each organisation is different. It's impossible to go into one and just treat it as though this is how we apply safety governance carte blanche. It just doesn't work that way. And so I think understanding context is really critical, understanding what that organisation is going through. So 
I um, heard from someone this morning who's in a commodity business where it's fallen through the floor and so obviously there's huge structural change going on in the industry. All of that then plays into well, what context is this business operating in and how does that affect our approach to safety? What kind of questions do we need to be asking? Is it still getting the attention in the board that it should be getting? Are we slipping back? There's just a whole range of things that I think both the management teams and the boards need to be aware of in terms of that context. In terms of starting the conversation with, with members of the board, we share our management pack with them and I think that's a monthly pack in which we show leading and lagging indicators on our process safety performance which really is our key risk. Uh, we are tremendously exercised by personal safety um, but you know process safety kills so uh, we show leading lagging indicators. Each incident that we've had that has led to on the personal safety side to a TRC um, is fully disclosed and discussed, uh, as is each um, process safety incident um, in, in accordance with an American Petroleum Institute classification. But you know, when they are serious, we disclose them and we describe them and we, we show what we learn from them. Um, and um, more importantly, sort of in terms of creating that quality dialogue, uh, when we have board meetings, A, we set quite a bit of time aside typically between two and three hours to discuss health and safety. And what we try and do, and, and we are sort of in a, in, a, in a middle model between calculative and generative or you know, your compliance to uh, super duper. Uh, we, we sit a bit in the middle as a management team and a, as a board on our journey. Um, but we, what we try and do is say, okay, you know, every year that board meeting is about process safety that meeting is about personal safety, that meeting is about occupational health, this meeting is about our systems and our compliance. And so, for instance, early this year we took our board through an independent legal review of our health and safety management system. Was it actually compliant with the law? I uh, fully agree that that isn't an, a, a tremendously ambitious uh, goal, but uh, important nevertheless. Um, recently we've taken them through what, uh, what we have done over the past year in terms of improving our process, uh, process safety. Uh, let me make another point because I, I think there is a risk also in the conversation so far today that health and safety is an add-on to an otherwise more financial or operational um, board management conversation and I actually I actually don't see us actually spend a lot of extra time because I actually see it as the same. So if I'm going to appeal to my customers, I need to be reliable. When they come with ships or when they ask for a batch of fuel in Weary Terminal in Auckland, they want my plant to be able to produce that and they want that stock in the tanks. So my plant needs to be reliable, it needs to be available. A plant that is reliable for my customers is safe for my staff. Because when it's unreliable, it becomes unsafe. When it's unsafe, it's unreliable. So actually, you have a key customer value proposition element, our reliability, which is actually the core part of our health and safety conversation. So although we lift health and safety out and we speak about it separately, actually health and safety is core of what you should be discussing anyway. Yeah, in that case, a customer service element, you know, we're actually in marketing land in terms of how we appeal to a customer and it translates one-on-one -on -one to keeping staff safe. Yeah? So, so you, kind of, you can make too much of, oh, there's a whole new game in town, it's called health and safety and now I need to spend more hours and I need to do stuff. Because quite frankly, it sits already entwined in your business and you just need to lift it out. If they're the only person on the board thinking that way, the board dynamic will move them along in time. If you have a whole board of people thinking that way, then that's back to, I think, recognising you've got a whole change process. And that really is down to the CEO with, in concert with the chairman. Your chairman is very helpful. Um, what I see, though, is it doesn't tend to be the case um, 
you might have a couple that, uh, of directors who just, they haven't been exposed in an operational sense to organisations. It's new for them. They're wanting to learn and they're wanting to be educated and they just need assistance with that. The chief executives who engage the director on the board who's actually get safety is probably one of the more effective ways to do it. And I know I've worked with chief executives in that way before. And so then there's kind of like a two two prong attack because you've got the management team and the director on the board who's the channel and everyone is responsible for safety so it's not that director's responsibility but they can be very helpful in influencing their peers around the table in why we need to be considering this beyond just a compliance framework and I agree with everything you've said Sjord it's it's not a bolt-on. Safety is there. It is part of the business. It's an integral part of the success of the organisation. It shouldn't require a great deal more work. I think the reality is initially it does because there's a huge education process that you need to go through. But once you achieve that, um, you have a board then, even if those directors were a bit sceptical or didn't quite understand it, um, I've seen them change quite quickly over time, particularly if there is an incident, CEOs might reach out to that particular director and ask them to come along with you if they're going off to inspect what might have happened or, you know, a bit after the event. There's different ways that I think you can engage them. <laughs>Five chief executives that report to me, and we're having these kind of conversations over the last few months. Uh, perhaps before I answer that, I'd just like to say one of the things that hasn't been mentioned uh, much today that I, I think actually is the biggest impediment that we have, and that is uh, what we need to develop is um, health and safety cultures in our organisations. And um, New Zealand is no different to most of the world. Uh, we are an overmanaged environment so our organizations are overmanaged and underled largely and so are communities so there's a real problem here in that we can have this discussion about what we need to do and what we should do but the real capacity is the capacity of leadership for the chief executives in terms of changing the culture of the organization and uh, so the kind of, I'll just take two chief executives as an example that I'm currently talking with they have 15 percent of their salary at risk that's not a bonus and uh, there's usually certain criteria that that's rewarded on. And so for this next year, we happen to have a, a 1 July um, commencement of the new financial year. Uh, we're talking of a number between 50 to 100%, and it's probably going to be closer to 100%. Uh, that's going to be um, at risk, and it's going to be related to the development of a health and safety culture, not simply the metrics. Harder to measure... But just because it's harder to measure doesn't mean it doesn't matter. And just because some of it's going to be qualitative and it's not all going to be quantitative doesn't mean that we should not address that issue. So, yeah, we're going pretty hard on this. Um, uh, it's a tougher ask and it's a significant part of their salary. And so that's one of the things I'm trying to do because I'm really trying to promote this perspective about cultural change. Because when you should say that it's part of all of our business, if we want our businesses to reach their potential, then we need to have a different cultural perspective in our organisations. Uh, because you use the word transactional. Our organisations are very transactional and the leadership is very transactional. So there's a change that's required that is a steeper mountain to climb than becoming compliant with the legislation. <laughs>
you know, it is transparent to your, to your talking. It makes me vulnerable because, of course, they come back with information. And I had, a, I had an incident the other week where sort of my newly appointed chair knew more than I did of the plant. So, you know, you get that sort of thing to deal with, but you just need to take it with a, a sense of irony and fun. But um, I, I think that's the best way for directors to actually understand how safe you know, the organization is that, uh, that they are governing. So for me, that, that's a critical one.